this project promotes the mainstreaming of gender in the media, gender in the media through a wide range of activities and interventions. And it is a media training workshop in this regard that brings our Swan sisters to Delhi now. We have uh, a second World Press Freedom Day message from the Director General of UNESCO, Ms. Audrey Azule. And I would like to request my colleague, Mr. Alamin Yusuf, the advisor communications at UNESCO New Delhi, to read out the message. A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. All protocols observed. I'll be reading the message from uh, Audrey Azule, the Director General of UNESCO, on the occasion of World Press Freedom Day. And this is the beginning of the message. Our liberty depends on the freedom of the press, and that cannot be limited without being lost. These words, written by Thomas Jefferson in 1786, when he was fighting for the independence of his country, have a universal scope that transcends the historical moment of the foundation of the United States of America. Any state under the rule of law that respects individual freedoms, and particularly the freedoms of opinion, concerns, and expression, relies on a free, independent press that is safe from censorship or coercion. The ideal of a state under the rule of law calls for well-informed citizens, transparent political decisions, public debates on topics of common interest, and the plurality of viewpoints that shapes opinions and undermines official truth and dogmatism. This shaping and informative power mainly falls to the press and the media in general, under all their graces and through various mediums. UNESCO is actively involved in defending the freedom of expression, which is the core of its mandate, and today, cele uh, today celebrates the 25th World Press Freedom Day and the theme chosen this year is an open invitation to think of the relations between the media, justice, and the rule of law. It is also an opportunity to examine the new challenges regarding the freedom of on online press. Freedom of the press, like any other freedom, is a never completely secure. And the development of a knowledge and information-based society via digital channels implies heightened vigilance to ensure the essential criteria of transparency free access and quality. Quality information requires working to check sources and select pertinent subjects. It calls for the ethics and independent of mind. It thus depends on entirely on the work of journalists. World President Day is also an opportunity to highlight the crucial role played by this profession in defending and preserving the democratic rule of law. In 2017, 79 journalists were assassinated worldwide in the exercise of their profession. UNESCO is committed to defending the safety of journalists and fighting against impunity for crimes committed against them. It also contributes to their training and helps the authorities in different countries to adapt their laws on freedom of expression to international standards. On the occasion of this year's World Press Freedom Day, UNESCO is organizing an international conference for the defense of the freedom of the press to be held in Ghana during which the UNESCO Guillermo Cano World President Prize will be awarded. The prize bears the name of the Colombian journalist assassinated in 1986 for bravely denouncing the power of drug trafficking cartels. Today, we invite you to celebrate the freedom of the press and the work carried out by journalists, and to participate in the online campaign around the hashtags World Press Freedom Day and hashtag Press Freedom. This is the end of the message from Audrey Azule, Director General of UNESCO, on the occasion of World President Day 2018. Thank you so much. We lost very noble life with high spirit journalist all of a sudden in one moment. And this is not happening just in Afghanistan. It can happen every country if we do not have clear idea and a clear voice to against the impunity for the crimes against journalists. And if we cannot secure the safety of the journalist, media itself will be killing himself. So the UNESCO thinks
three P's will be the three P's will be the key for addressing these issues. One is the prevention, one P is prevention, then second P is protection, and third P is prosecution. Prevent crime and protect the journalist and prosecute the cases. For that, the UNESCO has been working in many ways. The, we also celebrate the International Day to end the impunity for crimes against journalists, which was proclaimed again, the UN, in the year 2013. And we also work for the, the International Day of the International Day for the Universal Access to Information, which was also proclaimed by the UNESCO General Conference in the year of the 2015, <clears throat> to promote freedom of expression and rule of law and uh, defend human rights. We've seen a very interesting me meetings recently, which were happening in this region. One in Colombo, December last year, the, it was Asian the regional the seminar on the regional cooperation to promote freedom of expression and rule of law. Some the 150 participants attended from 20 countries and uh, agreed on we need more engagement of the states or the government in addressing the issue of impunity for the crime against journalists, and also the showed concern that the region has no regional human rights threat, uh, treaties or codes in charge of enforcing international standards on human rights. And, uh, my colleague Aramin attended that uh, seminar, which really actually we organized in collaboration with the Sri Lankan government. The, we have some kind of recommendation which can be shared with you today's event. And the second event was the happening in Kathmandu, which was organized by the UN, the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights. They invited the, the human rights the institutes, national human rights institutions from South countries and discussed how they can defend the human rights, including the freedom of expression, in a meaning way, in, especially in South Asian South country, South countries. So the, that can be also shared by our men, some result with the colleagues from the other countries, from South member states. <coughs> well, the, as I said, the, at this moment as well, a lot of journalists are at risk. Hello, everybody. It's a, such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation, uh, Shigeru from uh, UNESCO. Uh, as a former uh, war correspondent in, in Africa, it's a, you know, the issue of press freedom and uh, you know, protection of journalists is an issue very, very close to my heart. So it's a true pleasure to be here with you today. Um, of course, we address you know, and express a lot of concerns on a, on a day like this, but you know, I would also like to start on a, a you know on a very positive note and you know on a celebratory note, which is that I think you know, India has a incredibly vibrant uh, media scene, right? A huge number and a huge diversity of media outlets, and I really think that's something to celebrate. Um, and it's still growing, right? Even traditional media that you see in decline in many places around the world, in uh, in India, it is still growing. Radio, TV, uh, you know the the written press, you know, sometimes up to, I think in 2017, up to 10% uh, growth a year. I mean, it's incredible uh, to see that vibrancy. So I think, you know, let's not forget that, right? Before we address concerns, uh, just how, how special that is. And that is something that, you, that, that needs protecting, right? And that needs cherishing. Um, but of course, at the same time, there is a reason to be vigilant uh, because there are many challenges in the global media environment uh, as well. One was already mentioned, right, and, and of, of probably of biggest concern, right, direct threats to journalists. Uh, and the example of the bombing in Afghanistan on Monday is just the latest and one of the most uh, horrific uh, examples of that. Um, uh, and let's also forget, not forget that there have been targeted attacks in India as well this year, right? I mean, it's something to, to keep in mind. Um, 
But I think what has changed in, in, in over, the, over the maybe the past decades is where the biggest concern, including for me in Africa, uh, was, you know, in terms of, of uh, you know, direct violent attacks against me, was basically being caught in crossfire in, you know, not intended, uh, uh, you know, attacks necessarily. I think it is, you know, the biggest concern has actually been, you know, targeted attacks on, on journalists, right? I mean, when I was running around in, in the most dangerous places, just having a, you know, a t-shirt with press on it made me kind of feel secure because I did not have the sense that either of the parties would, you know, target me directly. Uh, right now, if you look at the example in Afghanistan, right, the suicide bomber was dressed up to look like a journalist and deliberately mingled with the journalists present at the scene to target them, right? So that's a whole different uh, uh, degree of danger that journalists get exposed to. And also in, in non-conflict settings, right? I mean, especially investigative journalists, especially when they investigate corruption or, um, you know, organized crime, they are at real, real um, uh, danger uh, of, of direct attacks. But another concern, another challenge in, in today's uh, global media environment is, I feel, self censorship by journalists themselves. Um, I think you see an increase in, in intimidation of journalists on a very personal basis, partly because of new media where everybody can have a, a voice and right, the, the journalists themselves, they are known, they have a, a Twitter account, they have other ways of, of being contacted directly. So you see certain groups uh, you know, with a hateful agenda who you know, directly target and intimidate uh, journalists. Um, you also have a growing commercial commercialization of, of the media. And I think that, you know, you see more and more media outlets that depend for 70 or 80 percent of their income on commercial or government advertising, right? And that also opens them up to certain pressures to self-censor, even without, you know, feeling that pressure directly, just, you know, out of fear to lose some of that funding. Uh, so, I mean, because their, their, their current business model needs that, right, that needs the advertising, they self-censor, you know, and then there's a the risk of litigation. Uh, and I know some of my uh, European media colleagues, uh, including in Germany, who deliberately, uh, you know, uh, keep that into account. Because, you know, if they write a story about a very rich individual, uh, for example, you know, who, who has done, you know, questionable things, they are, you know, they triple check. I mean, that's good, right? They really triple check the source and they want to make sure that they're absolutely right. But there is a certain hesitation because they know that this very rich individual can go after that, uh, that media outlet straight away and can sue them into bankruptcy almost, right? So there's, a, a, again, this risk of self-censorship that uh, I think has changed with time. Uh, a third challenge, I think, is the, the blurring of the lines between advertising and editorial reporting uh, and editorial material. Um, in the U.S., for example, I, I imagine a lot of you have, have seen it, right, where it was recently discovered that a lot of regional media outlets, you know, television broadcasters, uh, radio stations, uh, all under the same corporation, were basically during their news shows reading out political messages that had been handed down to them, uh, experts or journalists, but they really are advocates for a single issue. So what you get is more biased rather than balanced uh, opinion or uh, balanced news. Um, and, of course, we've seen the, the rise of, uh, of fake news as a, as a result. And, I mean, this is still the benevolent side of, you know, uh, of this biased news, right? Because these are people who have a, you know, who, who are feel passionate about a certain issue and are really pushing it and presenting it in different ways. Of course, we have also seen the rise of deliberate efforts to misrepresent, uh, right, uh, the the facts on the ground or to, to deliberately spread misinformation to, for, for whatever reason, right? Uh, so it's, a, it's of, of very, very big uh, concern, I think. Um, and a final uh, challenge uh, I see in today's media world is the, the deliberate silencing or demonization of critical media voices or critical independent voices, right? Especially on social media. Um, the use of you know, terms like anti-national, unpatriotic, or the most offensive personalized language, right, to basically dismiss or to assess the, of the journalist, right? I mean, you see that more and more, and it's, I think it's a really of great concern because 
uh, it's being used too lightly, right? And it creates an environment of us versus them, and it basically dismisses any, this opinion out of hand, right? Without any debate. Um, and I think that is very, uh, uh, very dangerous and very uh, worrying because by denying somebody the right to have a voice or opinion, you basically shut down any opportunity to have an informed exchange of ideas, right? An open contest of ideas within society, uh, which is really the, the basis of, of democracy in, in so many ways. So in conclusion, um, I think it's crucial in this media, global media environment, it's very, very important for journalists themselves to make sure that they adhere to the highest professional standards and ethical standards for journalism, to make sure you stay above the fray. Uh, I think it's really important, and I think it's not said enough, that we need many, many more female voices in, in journalism, because I really feel that in, in journalism and in the media overall, there is a lack of, of uh, female voices. They are there, but it's still, I think it's too little, and as a result, we, we are losing uh, a lot of, you know, of, of these perspectives. And I think also as consumers, us, right? The consumers of news, uh, I think we have started to expect that news is for free. Right? that you can get it online, but it comes at a cost that is not for free. Right? We need to uh, reflect on our own behavior um, and maybe you know, our willingness to pay for it. Right? Because if we don't pay, uh, that means that you know, they need to go to advertising or to alternative means. And you know, yes, you can, in all many places, you can get a free newspaper, but that, you know, it goes at the cost. The cost that we pay for that is uh, you know, a lack of quality uh, journalism uh, and uh, you know, quality uh, of the independent news or the independence of the, of the news sources that we, that we read. So I think it's something to keep in mind because really, right, online, uh, social media, we just now expect you know, that everything comes to us for free. But if, as long as we as consumers expect that, um, I think the quality of what we receive will, will suffer. Um, so, in, in conclusion, and I really liked what uh, the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, uh, said. Um, you know, um, I think journalism, building peaceful and inclusive societies, just like the judiciary, a free and independent press is crucial. It's really crucial for the functioning of any democracy. Defending journalism is defending our right to know the truth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. First of all, can I thank the organizers for inviting me um, again to join this inaugural session on behalf of the delegation of the European Union uh, to India. Um, we also believe that it is very important to mark 3rd of May as World Press Freedom Day. And we do it, as the director already said, for the 25th time this year. year and I'm very happy that we do it with long-term partners at the national and international level. And with all of you in this room here today. I'd like to also give special thanks to UNESCO who has um, taken a reading role in organizing organizing and coordinating such freedom of opinion and freedom of expression. As every year, the EU's high representative, Federica Mogherini, has today released a declaration on behalf of the European Union on the occasion of World Press Freedom Day, and hard copies were distributed in the room or are available here at the rostrum. There she said, and I quote, on this day, we celebrate World Press Freedom Day in a difficult context for journalism. Freedom of expression and freedom of the press are threatened around the world. Attacks against media and journalists are attacks against democracy, against freedom of us all. We pay tribute to all journalists in Europe and worldwide who have lost their lives in the exercise of their profession. We call on all states to condemn violence against journalism to take action to improve the safety of journalists with particular attention to women journalists and to bring perpetrators and instigators of such violence to justice. 
the EU and the member states are determined to continue protecting and promoting freedom of opinion and expression, both online and offline, as democracy cannot without these rights. It cannot be repeated often enough that press freedom plays a crucial role in promoting good governance, transparency and accountability. Independent journalism is vital to hold states accountable and to monitor democratic processes. And we have a dedicated policy that guides our action in this field at the global, at the regional, at local levels and also manifold practical support. Uh, respect for freedom of expression is actually integrated in all EU policies and development programs. Across the European Union, legislation, policies and instruments have been designed to strengthen media freedom and to improve transparency, credibility and diversity. Globally, the EU and member states are strongly invested in creating the international framework for these efforts. You may perhaps know that at the European Union, there are several resolutions to this effect and EU member states were instrumental for the adoption, for instance, of a resolution on the safety of journalists and a resolution on the promotion, protection and enjoyment of human rights on the internet. So they're fielded by a number of EU member states in cross-national uh, coalitions and supported by all uh, the EU. And the EU also supports the mandate of the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the promotion and protection of the right to freedom of opinion and expression. That's an independent expert who on behalf um, of the Human Rights Council travels in the world and also issues uh, thematic reports independently on those issues. Um, moreover, um, and I turn back to today's declaration of uh, Mogherini, the EU will continue funding targeted projects in third countries, enhancing quality of journalism, access to public information and freedom of expression. We also support programs dedicated to promoting the role of women in the media in particular. We will also consistently condemn violence against journalism. And the EU has vouched in the declaration today that we will continue to take concrete steps to prevent and respond to attacks against journalists and bloggers, including emergency assistance to protect human rights defenders at high risk, sometimes by means of relocation. So there are dedicated programs to actually afford such um, assistance. Moreover, through various programs, we support independent judicial institutions, access to justice and human rights education. In India, the EU has supported many projects uh, in these fields and I know that former and current partners of ours are at the event uh, today and I look forward to interacting also uh, in the break and during the day with you. Um, I also look forward with interest to the discussion of current developments here in India, including if possible some comments on the ranking by the World Press Freedom Index that was also referred to because it is on a, on a sliding scale as some have already remarked. Turning to the specific panels uh, later this morning, so while the EU and all member states protect freedom of expression as a fundamental right, we are of course not immune to uh, problems today and they concern media freedom, pluralism, and also, as you saw lately, the killing of journalists for different reasons, but there were two very dramatic cases um, over the course of the past months. And one was quite close because it was the mother of a friend of mine actually who was targeted in, in Malta. So, um, we have uh, started, to, I think, to feel the need for renewed vigilance to actually address these problems. There's also new vigilance and more dedicated resources to checking news that are distributed in Europe and trying to bring out the real facts. I know it's difficult to claim that, but trying to at least count the counter story. And we find it very important to, to screen and then put out um, the information in a proactive manner, not just sit there and um, sort of wait <laughs> and hope that the news goes away, but address it and try to tell our story, how we see it, and also try to invest into positive news. And then we are also grappling <clears throat> with current issues such as the fight against hate speech or radicalization online, and we're very dedicated to doing that while upholding freedom of expression, and that is a difficult um, issue. We have an internet referral unit on which online content, for instance, is being checked. We will bring some experts to India in two weeks to exchange experience with practitioners here, because we realize that this is a challenge uh, very uh, much, actually, for every uh, democratic society, and that learning from each other, exchanging experience is very important. 
So let me close by again paying tribute to the incredible courage of journalists in the exercise of their profession. Um, I wish us all an interesting meeting and productive discussions today. So many thanks. Ayogi will be sorely missed. Um, now that you are moving to Bangkok, thank you for everything. Um, I'd also like to thank all the other partners. The Center for Communication Governance has been privileged to be associated with this event um, and to do our little part in supporting press freedom. Um, I agree with everything that you have heard this morning, the video recorded speeches, as well as the three that have taken place uh, before me. Um, as, as a lawyer, what we try to do is um, the Center for Communication Governance works to do its best to engage with the legal system so that we are able to support the journalists as best we can. And there are parts of this that the legal system has limited interactions with. So for example, uh, Geeta Seshu, who is my fellow member of the Press Freedom Committee, has just come out with a Freedom of the Press report in India. And her report points out that 13 journalists have already been attacked this year, three have been killed. And that increasingly the attacks um, on journalists Journalists are moving from the direct shootings, Gauri Lankesh, uh, to attacks that take the form of car accidents reminiscent of the journalist who did that great Panama paper story and she was killed in Malta. I, I believe that that was a bomb. The journalists have been run over by cars. They've been attacked by mobs. And they're also coming, uh, coming under attack, if you note online, from other sources. They're at the receiving end of vicious abuse and threats, the very latest being uh, Mr. Ravish, who is... Um, a vernacular language journalist of the highest integrity. Uh, if, if you check on Twitter, there have been reports that he's been threatened quite a lot over the last few days. Um, and so these are threats in which the law needs to respond by offering remedy. Uh, on the positive side, uh, Geeta Seshu says that there have been a few rounds of redressal by the judicial system for murders that have taken place already. Uh, but on the other side, um, a journalist has, has just been charged with sedition for his work in Bastar. The defamation cases against journalists remain, um, and, and they form a chilling effect in addition to the private censorship that, that you mentioned. Um, so there's all of this to contend with. And then there are the new problems presented by the digital age. So we at the Center for Communication Governance, we work with press freedom and with freedom of expression, but we specialize in, um, in the online in the online world, how freedom of expression works there, how freedom of press is affected by algorithms and, um, and, and the over-the-top services. And I think that this new world presents a new series of challenges. So in the next session, we're going to discuss this in more detail, but um, we've recently finished a report that discusses harmful speech online, the ways in which the state is able to, uh, to negotiate problematic content before the digital world, as well as in the digital world. To give you an example, internet shutdowns can now be used by the state to just cut off the flow of information completely. They're a blunt instrument tool, and it's being used uh, with, a, with great frequency now in India. Um, the, the other sort of um, creeping change that is taking place, you would have seen it in the form of Cambridge Analytica, but uh, there's also the question of web-based platforms and algorithms and the way in which they act both on their own account as well as on account of the state to block speech, uh, to offer surveillance uh, to the state. And this is, this is a new world of problems that we need to contend with. Um, so I, I wanted to highlight all of this to you and uh, to conclude by saying that I, I think that those of us who get to do this work to protect press freedom are privileged because as the speakers before me have said, there's nothing more salient to democracy than a free media. And I want to pay tribute to those journalists who do this path-breaking work knowing often that they're going to their death. Um, so in 2009, there was an editorial, a heartbreaking editorial written by a Sri Lankan journalist called Lasanta Vikramatunge, who wrote this editorial knowing that he would be murdered for his story. And he says that, um, that I'm doing this work for all of you. We, we stand to gain no glory from our sacrifice, but we do it because it's necessary for society. And I, I hope that we can think of these people and do our best to protect them. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, UNESCO, for taking up what is essentially uh, our cause of uh, practicing journalism. 
uh, being given 15 minutes and there is a controversy in the country whether one can speak for 15 minutes without notes or not. But since the matter at hand is of such importance that uh, I will refer to my notes. The good news is that Cambridge Analytica is shut down. The bad news is that the Facebook is coming up with a dating app. So you know what the future is like. And I start with these two because of on Press World Press Freedom Day, I want to talk something about the weapon of choice for our politics now. And that is social media. These two cases of Facebook and Cambridge Analytica tell us that how countries can interfere in electing sovereign governments in other countries. Countries within their uh, boundaries, like we are seeing these days in Karnataka, are using social media as a weapon of choice. If you look at India, it's the second largest market subscription base for world's four largest technology companies, Google. And you'll be shocked to know that the revenue of these four companies is less than 0.01% from India. So why would you run an empire to service 250 million people when there's no revenue? Because their data is the new currency. And that has led to, as the uh, um, FBI uh, investigation in the US and uh, in the uh, UK and in many other Scandinavian countries and in Europe, has led to now the government of India setting up a parliamentary committee on online media and its misuse. So this is going to be now a new chapter in India's parliamentary democracy and how it is being affected, it's being distorted by social media. That's the big question, we should talk about it now. Everyone has talked about, a lot of people, uh, knowledgeable people have talked about that how uh, India, uh, uh, over the internet uh, shutdowns are uh, really causing a big problem and it's become also a tool of the governments to take free press freedom away from people. Uh, ICRIA, a very well-established uh, uh, think tank in Delhi, has just uh, put out a report that by internet shutdowns alone, Indian economy lost $3 billion last year. You can imagine the kind of impact it has, and the report also says very specifically that most of the people who lost these uh, jobs or this uh, business of $3 billion were small companies, the medium and small companies, because their uh, livelihood and their day-to-day -day functioning was impacted by it. Think about a carpet seller in Jammu and Kashmir or a travel agent uh, in Rajasthan. Their job is, uh, the day's job is gone if the internet is shut down for three days. And this is a new kind of press freedom we are talking about. We've had number of cases in India where WhatsApp uh, uh, messages by people have been uh, taken up by police and people have been put in jail for sedition and things like that. Uh, while the government itself as a policy is using social media as its campaign. Every there are 97 departments, I think, in government of India today. All of them are on social media. There are more than 200 departments, including the Space Research Organization and the DRDO, are supposed to be very um, secretive departments. They're all on social media. And as a policy, we are using these platforms, who we are investigating now, so you, you can know the kind of leverage the government has today on these four companies 
whose total revenue is more than three trillion dollars. It's more than India's power in check. But then how do you, the theme should be, I mean, theme I am talking to go, uh, talk about is keeping media in check. And this is how media is being kept in check. There's a parliamentary committee against social media giants. And uh, there are regulatory mechanisms now coming into force, which are being used by the government. We are talking about freedom of press. I'm talking about freedom of press to do their business. I'll just give you two, three quick examples. Just tell me when we are 12 minutes. We are going to, uh, you're going to uh, so, uh, see very soon what the uh, South Asia uh, part of the report on uh, press freedom says today. Uh, I will not take away your thunder, but uh, there's one thing I'd like to say is that it's gone down uh, in terms of India, it's sliding back while we are claiming that our GDP is going up and uh, that's important. And why the GDP is going up in a going, growing GDP, the first thing which grows with it is the media. And it's usually about one and a half to two times, two uh, percent more than the rest of the GDP. Because m business needs media first. So the first money in the growing business comes from India. That's why everyone is coming to India and you are seeing this FDI and the Sensex is going through the roof. But how the media is being kept under that check? I'll, these are all public, uh, uh, this is all in public domain. But as someone talked about uh, self-censorship, you won't read it anywhere. So I'll just tell everyone here that what's been happening. The Ministry of Information is, uh, of uh, Broadcasting has decided not to take any action on any applications on news channels. So it's been four months that no uplinking permission has been given by the ministry. No downlinking permission has been given for the last two months. New satellite channels which came up in 2016 was 75, 2017 it came down to 45. 97 are pending, their files are with the ministry, and unless you tow their lines, unless you be reverential to them, the files will remain there. So this is the new freedom of press that you would not, you would not let the media do its business. There are 59 companies involved in this. 30 are in news and 29 are new companies who applied for licenses and 29 are existing companies. TRAI, the telecom regulator in India, is actively working on a consultation paper which aims to finally auction the spectrum for television downlinking and uplinking. And you can imagine what's going to happen there. We have seen the results of telecom auctions and how telecom auctions in this country have led to a market where a very few people have that spectrum. Instead of diffusing it, instead of letting thousands flower bloom, we are proposing a system of television spectrum which is by auction. So naturally the, the biggest bidders are going to buy it and it's going to be bought by the biggest, uh, uh, the uh, largest corporations. It's not come yet, it's on the website. I, I suggest all of you uh, see that and give your uh, views about that. The NBA, the National uh, the News Broadcasters Association, who I'm a member of, we, by the way, are the only members of the News Broadcasters Association regulatory, self-regulatory system because we want it to be a sensible media organization. And unlike uh, the online uh, um, space where there's no regulation, we want it to be bound by a system and we follow uh, NBA guidelines. In India, there are 286 million households today. 64% have TV. 
and the increase in the TV buying houses, the new TV houses, has dropped down to 3.5%. And that is because of the government taxation system. Today, if I want to read magazine, I have to pay 18% tax GST. And you know what is the GST on gold? 3%. Another leverage to keep media in check. And it is being used, uh, I can say it with a lot of uh, discretion and discrimination. There are newspapers, television channels who have been thrown out of government lists of their preferred platforms for advert government advertising. So the, when we talk about freedom of media, we have to also talk about freedom of doing media business. In our country today, we have more than 8 lakh crore worth of non-performing assets with the banks, half of which are with the public sector banks, actually more than half, about 60% or so. So unless the media people can raise funds from the market, raise funds from, uh, get sponsorships from the government or operate in a free market system. You know, there are 23 licenses you have to get to start a news channel in India. In Hong Kong, it's none. Even countries like Russia have less. And I think that's why we are uh, worse than Russia today. And at every step when you start to open up a company, there is a license or something, some, something or other. A company called uh, Quintilion has incurred a loss of 37 crore last year because no other than the global giant Bloomberg. But they are License has not come and it's more than two years. So they've hired 350 journalists, they are paying them. Uh, state interference in media operations which we are facing today. Last year we were here and uh, we were talking about internet shutdowns and basically uh, that. But this year, since the uh, theme has changed, it's about uh, uh, keeping power in check. So these are the power tools which are being used here. But all is not so bad. I'll end by giving three examples that how media is pushing back and how we should go forward. In Rajasthan, the bill had come that uh, a case uh, 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 basically has to, uh, a permission has to be taken to file a case against a government servant and that ordinance had to be, uh, I mean, it lapsed finally because uh, there was push from the media and from smaller newspapers like Rajasthan Patrika, they pushed it and it went. Second big thing was the uh, um, taking away the accredit accreditation of journalists, which was a big mistake. I, as a journalist, I know that even if I have an RFID card, and I've done it a number of times in the past as a rookie reporter, that you go into a building, say North Block or South Block, and you meet everyone in that building and then come back. That's my right to go and meet a public servant. Why would I need someone's uh, uh, <clears throat> permission to do that? And another important thing I forgot, which we've been doing consistently, is uh, how the right to information is being curbed. A lot of media persons, including uh, some of our team who are sitting here, use right to information as a last resort because you do not get information from government departments. But the, if you look at the number of RTIs which are being filed and the number of answers which are given by the government, I mean, they can say that we've got 100% track record, 
but what are you what questions you are answering and what is the information you are giving back and we were told that most of the uh, questions which are being raised through RTI are very frivolous and we are giving always this one example that uh, how many uh, bottled waters were bought by the Prime Minister's office in last one year? I have answered that question a lot myself when I was working with the Prime Minister's office. But buried in these RTI applications are things about movement of files, about licenses being given, about what's happening with the security, about all the subjects journalists rightfully have a right to ask. And all that is being hampered. So this is how media is being checked. So that accreditation uh, sword, which was uh, uh, sword to be put on top of journalists is gone. So that's another thing because the entire media came together against that. And the third positive thing I'd like to say here is, in press freedom, that even if a government wants to stifle, the ministers in the government want to stifle uh, a crime, they cannot. And that was a big victory for all of you actually in Katua, where the two ministers had to resign. And a probe was ordered. So, all in all, the situation in the Indian media, in the words of my former employer and uh, one of my gurus in journalism, Arun Puri, media in India is in peril. And he said, because the democracy in India is in peril. And if democracy in India is in peril, the nation is in peril. And the only way you can govern this huge and vast and disparate country is through democracy. And if you try to stifle media in this kind of multilingual, multi-regional, multi-layered democracy, you are inviting disaster. And all of us here, it's our duty to not let that disaster happen. Thank you. Please take all the photographs you can now. <laughs> As Derek uh, rightfully pointed out that it's uh, uh, even the bombing, the suicide bombing in Afghanistan was targeted attack on the journalist because uh, the suicide bomber blew himself up. He was disguised as a journalist and he went into, into all the journalists who were reporting the first suicide attack and detonated the bomb. That means it was, it was a targeted attack. Uh, and on the same day, uh, BBC pastor journalist Ahmad Shah was uh, dead in uh, so dead in eastern province uh, of coast in Afghanistan. Uh, I don't want to show you the next photo, but I should because it's it's a very horrible photo. Uh, I, I warn you not to look at much, but this is what it looks like uh, when wh what happened in uh, Kabul. It was actually the bomb detonated. You can see the cameras burning. You can see the cameramen and uh, the dead bodies. And it's uh, really sad that every year I I came here uh, last year when I came here. I came uh, with with the very bad news uh, of uh, a blogger being killed in Maldives, and this year I came uh, with uh, this uh, really bad news that had just happened. And it doesn't seem like there is any stopping to all this uh, that is happening in South Asia. Uh, as you said earlier, this is the 16th report, and if you go back to the to all those reports which is available in the IFG website, you will see that uh, there seems to be no no uh, stopping to all this what is happening in South Asia. So this year, uh, one of the new things that we introduce uh, is uh, we try to look uh, look through the uh, journalist safety indicator JSI of UNESCO on uh, according to those indicators what had happened in South Asia, and you can see very uh, the numbers which are really big. Uh, 
uh, the killing of journalist 35 in a year. But uh, this is not 2017. This starts from May uh, 2017 and comes until the end of April 2018. In these 12 months, there were 13 killing of journalist, 37 threats against the life of journalists. But this, you have to note that uh, in countries around uh, South Asia, normally a threat are not properly reported and documented. Uh, the threats to journalists, 10 non-fatal attacks on journalists in which they survived, 105. Uh, threats against media institutions, four attacks on media institutions, five. And of course, the last one is not into the GSI, but I try, uh, I included it to just to show you how, what is the situation of journalists, because 68 journalists were detained or jailed uh, in between that time for uh, all the nonsense reasons. Uh, it, it wasn't for any crime that they have committed, but rather than for their works, they were detained and jailed. Uh, why we are counting this number? Uh, some, uh, last year I was asked uh, by someone, uh, not here, in another meeting that why IFJ is counting the number of dead bodies? Why IFJ is counting the number of, uh, number of people, uh, journalists being attacked? And uh, many times in my job as the South Asia coordinator and probably also the Sukuma uh, Mural Dharan here who, who was uh, the South Asia coordinator before me with the IFJ, we wondered basically in despair, why I'm counting all these number of killed journalists. But uh, I told them at that time that I know the answer, and the answer is so strong that gives me the strength to continue my work of counting these dead bodies. Because if we stop counting, if we stop monitoring attacks, if we stop raising our voice for justice, and if we stop campaigning for the safety of journalists, then many, many more journalists will be killed. So this, this, this number we are trying to keep in check just by monitoring and counting those, uh, those dead bodies. And numbers alone doesn't say the whole story. Because behind these numbers, there are some very innocent faces of the people. Uh, and behind these faces that you can see on the picture right now, these are uh, eight of the journalists who were killed in Kabul on that day. But uh, these, if you look at these faces, you know what we have lost. And we are still to see, and I haven't bought that photos, but we are still to see the innocent faces that were dependent on these people, the families of these people, the friends of these people that have suffered due to all this. And these people were not, uh, were not killed uh, because they did some crime, but, but because they did, uh, they did their professional duties. So I just want to, uh, want to uh, uh, say that the numbers alone doesn't tell the story, it's the faces and the faces that we see, like these faces, and the faces we don't, ne we never see, but there are faces behind these faces that we don't see. That's the real story. And if you look into the India uh, in those uh, in those uh, uh, 12 months gone, 12 months, there were eight journalists killed. Uh, I just want to point out that five of them, uh, kind of very uh, sad stories. Uh, Gauri Lankesh, all you know, shot dead at her home uh, for, for expressing herself, for being, being a critical voice. Uh, Santanu Bhaumik, I don't know how many of uh, you remember him, but he was a journalist uh, of a cable television channel. And he was covering a demonstration, and he was lynched, killed by the mob, uh, because he, the channel he was working for did not give enough coverage to that demonstration. And this all happened in front of the police, in front of all the people uh, that a 20-year-old uh, journalist had to lose his life just because he was reporting for a certain television uh, station. And in the same uh, Tripura, uh, you probably know a very veteran journalist, Sudip uh, Datta Bahumik, he was uh, around 50 years old. He was uh, killed by, by, uh, at, the, at the headquarters of the para paramilitary uh, state rifles uh, by the security uh, security personnel, a very senior security person. He was asked to come to the headquarter, and he was shot dead because of his critical uh, reportings. Uh, Naveen Nishchal, I don't know <coughs> how, how many of you uh, remember him. He, it was just a recent case in March, uh, March 25th uh, and 26th. These both uh, Naveen Nishchal and Sandeep Sharma lost their uh, lives, uh, apparently in accidents, but I don't know how many of you, you have seen the videos uh, from which I have taken this uh, screen grab, which clearly shows that uh, these accidents, 
these accidents that happen to journalists are not always the accident. Uh, I don't know if you have seen this video, but if you look at this video, you will clearly know that uh, the dump of the truck uh, deliberately uh, pushed, uh, changed its lane to kill, uh, to hit this uh, journalist on the motorbike and killed. Uh, this is the video of uh, Sandeep Sharma, uh, who, who wrote uh, stories about the uh, stories about the uh, sand and land mafia and police in, in that uh, region. So, and when you look into this thing, uh, that journalist being killed, uh, another very uh, important aspect uh, is the is about the impunity. While we are today celebrating the World Press Freedom Day, uh, saying that uh, media uh, justice and uh, the rule of law, it seems it seem a very far-fetched idea that media uh, media can be connected with the justice and rule of law, at least in, in this part of uh, the world where impunity is very, very high. Uh, you're thinking that the situation of a ruler journalist, you will see a new chapter in this year's report about the ruler journalist because uh, uh, the city journalists have some kind of uh, some kind of leverage, some kind of uh, facilities, some kind of uh, better benefits than those journalists in the ruler, uh, rural areas who uh, who often find themselves at the center of dangerous situation because of the open conflict between various communities, vested interests, mining barons, tribal chiefs, land, sand, and liquid mafias and all, all uh, criminal gangs and everything. And uh, journalists in rural areas are often underpaid, not given enough benefits, and exploited. Uh, and are working on high risks and low safety, are in identity crisis, and are, are lowly valued by the society. And despite that, uh, there are many uh, rural journalists who, who continue uh, to do these works, uh, reporting on the issues that are, that are um, in most of the times, ignored by mainstream media, but really, really important for, for our society because uh, around 70% of uh, South Asia is a rural, uh, rural area. And of course, that brings us to another another new uh, addition to this year's report, which is about the internet shutdown. If you look uh, at some page in this, there is a whole list of internet shutdown that we have recorded last year, and it is 97, uh, 97 instances of internet uh, instances of internet shutdown in South Asia in 12 months, and that's quite high. And that ranges from a few hours of internet shutdown to 45 days of some, uh, continuous internet shutdowns. Um, of course, there are details on where it is uh, happening. Of course, there are all the illogical uh, logic behind shutting down uh, internet. But uh, uh, country-wise, India is the global leader in shutting down India. Uh, that's a very dubious, uh, dubious uh, crown to have, I think. But uh, in last uh, these two uh, last 12 uh, months, they have shut down internet uh, 82 times whereas Pakistan had shut it down 12 times, and uh, there are one instance of internet shutdown or attempts to shut down internet in Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, and Bangladesh. And as, as said, it, is, it has become a very easy tool uh, to curb uh, or to put the restriction on freedom of expression of the people. And we say uh, last year the IFJ and many of our affiliates in this region joined the global, uh, global movement called Keep It On, which is uh, uh, against the internet shutdown. Uh, uh, we say that uh, the first casualty, the first casualty of any internet shutdown, is the freedom of expression. Uh, so this, uh, as I said, this South Asia Press Freedom Report is the 16th annual IHJ UNESCO report by the South Asia Media Solidarity Network, which is a network of uh, uh, journalist unions and journal, uh, journal, journalist right uh, organization across South Asia. Uh, consist of uh, country analysis of uh, press freedom situation that's always there since its beginning. Uh, but uh, uh, this year there is also the special reports on impunity and gender, which are also uh, uh, which are also kind of a permanent chapter in this report. I don't want to talk much about impunity, but uh, on the gender, I want to point out that last year we talked uh, last uh, two years we have been talking about the online harassment of females male journalist and that, that's still a big, big, big issues, uh, issue around uh, there. If you can't shut down a journalist uh, by good means, then you have the social media to take over to accuse all type of thing. We have, we have examples from India where uh, journalists have been called prostitute and all bad names and stuff and her phone numbers have been shared on social media asking to call her and stuff like that. So uh, it's, it's a kind of, uh, kind of a thing that's happening. But this year we don't look into the online harassment thing. This year rather we look into how journal, uh, the female journalists are fighting back against it. 
uh, how how the Me Too, uh, Me Too mo uh, movement around the, uh, that started in Hollywood and have uh, rippled around the uh, world has come to South Asia as well, and how the journalist, female journalists in South Asia are actually fighting and creating a strategy to uh, a strategy to fight the sexual harassment uh, uh, in the workplace as well as uh, in the online online uh, media of course we have special reports on rural journalists and shut down and there is of course uh, as always uh, the annexure of uh, the list of incidents of press freedom violation from across the region from all eight countries but this year's new addition to that is it is now based on the unesco journalist safety indicators it's a bit more than that of course there are uh, more listing than uh, as required by GSI, but it is uh, there. Uh, as you can see, like uh, these are the reports uh, for last five or uh, six years, uh, which is continuous, uh, continuously growing. And uh, uh, finally, I want to uh, uh, conclude by uh, saluting all the courageous journalists in South Asia who, in the face of the adversity, its media faceless to preserves. Uh, despite the suffering and despite the increased controls and criminalization of their craft. Uh, rural journalists in small towns and villages risk their lives to bring their stories to their communities and beyond. Uh, women journalists across the region is speaking up about the uh, insidious impact of sexual harassment and how they are bravely working to change uh, the story. And uh, of course, uh, by saluting all the journalist union, uh, media rights association and the journalists for relentlessly pursuing justice for their fallen journalist while continuing to report on uh, continuing to report on a difficult situation I will again come back to Kabul where uh, one of the very uh, one of the early tweet for after the Kabul attack uh, said that you will you are not going to say uh, see any photos from this event because all the photo journalists were killed or injured in the incident but still we saw a lot of lot of photos from that incident uh, despite having uh, friends uh, colleagues being targeted and killed, the photo journalist in Kabul continued working there and that's that's actually the situation in whole journalists continue to work despite all this happening around us. Uh, so a big a big uh, note. Uh, with that uh, I thank you very much for listening to me and the report is with you. Uh, you can always go through it, but of course, uh, as I said earlier, it's it's a very uh, to read it is a very depressing uh, experience. Although there are quite a few f quite a few good stories, uh, positive stories in there as well. Thank you very much. Difficult to summarize a, a hundred-page regional report which covers eight countries in less than twenty minutes, but that's something Ojal manages to do successfully for us every year. So we can't thank him enough for that excellent overview of this year's. South Asia Press Freedom Report. Uh, just to add one point to what Ujjal said, uh, there is a slight innovation that we have introduced into the report this year. Uh, apart from the country reports and special thematic reports on rural journalists, internet shutdowns, etc., we are also beginning to consider this report as a monitoring tool for SDG 16.10. Uh, you know, target 16.10 of the Sustainable Development Goals talks about ensuring public access to information and this target is, is actually seen as being most closely associated with media operations, with the work of journalists and the media. And there are certain indicators that are closely linked to the monitoring of target 16.10. And those have to do with the journalist safety and, and UNESCO's own journalist safety indicators. So you will find that in the annexure to this report, there are constant references made to these JSIs and to these indicators that go into monitoring 16.10. And in doing this, we hope that this South Asia Press Freedom Report is actually going to become one of the definitive tools for monitoring this particular sustainable development goal in the region. And that will be quite an achievement over time, we think. So that's something that IFJ has been very supportive of, and we've been able to start in cooperation with them. Uh, now, we're very pleased to let you know that the third of our guest speakers, Ms. T.K. Rajalakshmi, has also joined us in the course of Ojal's presentation. And so we'd like to conclude this session by inviting her to make the closing address in a sense. And, uh, uh, well, make your address, please. So me happens to be the president of the Indian Women's Press Corps, very recently elected. And also the deputy, um, sorry, the senior deputy editor of Frontline, Ms. Rajalakshmi.
Okay, thanks a lot uh, for having me here to speak today. Um, in fact, first of all, I'd like to you know, apologize for being late. Uh, I got caught in a terrible traffic jam. I come all the way from Ghazabad. So, uh, so today somehow uh, it, was, it was a bad day for me, though uh, <laughs> I'd hope to sort of make it in time. And, uh, and therefore, sincere, you know, uh, sincere apologies for that. Uh, I, think, uh, I think, you know, more or less, uh, uh, I think you know, the previous speaker has, you know, outlined, uh, in fact, uh, and, and I think I perhaps missed a part of the earlier, earlier session, uh, I think, which must have given, you know, an overview of the state of world press freedom as well as, uh, uh, as, well as the state of press freedom that exists, you know, in the region. Uh, so I, I would just like to uh, speak on, uh, you know, on certain certain aspects which which uh, which may have been covered too, uh, and I'm not going to keep it too too long. Also, um, for instance, um, uh, we we at uh, we you know as a let's say you know uh, as a women's journalist organization uh, of which you know I'm a part of, and uh, and I also happen to have spent around uh, two two and a half you know decades in journalism itself as my uh, you know, as my grey hair would show, uh, uh, I, 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 I seem to, uh, uh, I mean, I feel, you know, that, uh, that the kind of, you know, challenges that we faced 20 years ago uh, are, I think, substantially different from what we face today. Uh, and it's not because, and, and it's not because, you know, um, it's not because of, uh, uh, of that, of the things, things, you know, have not changed substantially. Things have changed uh, substantively, perhaps you know, in a political sense, and also also in in you know, an economic sense. So so both you know it's a combination of uh, of both you know the economic climate as well as you know the political climate, which has undergone a serious change over the last 20, 25 years. You know, everybody had this huge expectation that at the end of the Cold War, the world is going to become a safer place, and that uh, and that you know, and that all kinds of divisions are going to you know automatically melt into uh, sort of you know the oblivion, uh, or rather you know. Uh, so it so it didn't happen. So it did not happen because it because it does not happen. You know, uh, it does not happen automatically. So we've had uh, we've uh, uh, in fact we've had you know economic as well as social divisions. Uh, uh, let's say increase and in fact sharpen over the last two and a half decades. Whether whether uh, you can say uh, that that the world definitely has not become a safer place, you know, to live in, and that uh, uh, and if I may say so, that there is a certain uh, certain definite growth uh, or uh, or in fact like a definitive growth, you know, in a um, or or rather you know right wing shift. Or rather, a right word shift towards towards economic policies as well as social outlooks. Uh, so I think that that uh, uh, I think that has to be I think at the forefront of any uh, of any I think background when we discuss freedoms as such. So this entire uh, so this so this um, uh, so this framework that I think UNESCO also had and and perhaps various other organizations also used to used to say and ha you know and hold. And hold this opinion that authoritarian, you know, that there was this little division between, you know, authoritarian governments and between, you know, liberal, uh, 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 let's say, democracies. But we have, but we see that today uh, that the, the that uh, that authoritarianism, you know, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the freedoms uh, as well as media freedoms of people uh, is also being seen uh, in the so-called, you know, Western, Western liberal. Uh, uh, democracies and and in fact in fact the rsf that is the um, the rsf itself says that uh, that that in fact europe has turned into a crisis region for for journalists uh, and 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 it and, and it mentions populist policies now now obviously the populist policies are you know are more in the sense of nationalistic policies which 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 also uh, has a certain you know resonance here in india today where where journalists have been uh, have been somewhat you know compelled to take uh, either uh, either a nationalistic point of view or uh, uh, you know what certain sections in the government think you know is an anti national you know point of view so you are so you are you know automatically uh, uh, you know um, 
sort of segregated into these two two uh, two you know opposite uh, 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 you know opposite points of view you know depending on uh, you know which 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 side uh, uh, which side of the government you are on so if you if you if you essentially you know oppose a certain policy of the government you are you are bound to be today seen as as anti uh, 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 as anti you know national and not uh, and not anti government per se you know you know rather you know objectively you know anti government so so you are so here so here you know critique of policy has has become a certain uh, you know uh, uh, you know has assumed a certain you know meaning today uh, uh, in today's world you know and that is dangerous because today uh, today journalists you know are not free free in that, that sense to take positions to take positions, whether it's to do with with the growing, you know, polarization in society, whether it's to do with the growing sectarianism in society, or whether it's to do with growing crimes against women in society. Why can't journalists, that as citizens, also take a take a position on these things? And uh, uh, and today is the time to take uh, to to uh, to take a certain position on these things too. Now. Um, now, what I uh, would also like to speak uh, to, sp to speak on, you know, uh, you know, and to reflect is that how uh, that that how you know democracy itself gets subverted by you know by this a by this uh, you know by deepening you know inequality in society uh, you know and deepening social divisions in society of which uh, of which journalists form an integral part and and uh, and so when 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 the nature of uh, of let's say democracy itself gets subverted because of what's happening today, uh, it is it is it is quite you know inevitable that the nature of journalism, uh, as well as the attacks on citizens, as well as the attacks you know, on journalists, will get exacerbated. I mean, how uh, how can uh, can one not discuss uh, uh, as to how uh, things you know have come to a state of past you know, in Afghanistan with you know with you know when you talk about the attacks on journalists, it's not that it happened you know, overnight. There has been a uh, the, there has been a systematic you know intervention by 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 certain countries you know in the whole region in West Asia as well as Afghanistan which which has led to a, uh, to the state of uh, state of affairs. It's not that journalists have uh, you know have suddenly become victims of suicide suicide bombers and have uh, you know and are coming into uh, you know conflict with you know in such situations you know the uh, the. The interventionist policies, in fact, uh, you know, I'd say, in fact, the militarist interventionist policies of certain countries have led to a state of a state of affairs in in certain parts of the world where where ordinary citizens, yes, and including journalists, find themselves threatened and uh, and are getting killed. So, so it is not possible, I think, to uh, I think to delink, uh, you know, uh, the state of global uh, global politics, you know, as well as you know what is happening. Specifically in these countries, which have endangered the lives of journalists, yes, and and which are uh, uh, and which are you know endangering the lives of ordinary citizens, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. You have children, women, uh, you're getting killed, getting you. You have hospitals, schools getting bombed. You have civilian, uh, civilian, civilian life has got completely, you know, torn, uh, torn into shreds in these countries. I mean, how, how, I mean, how else do you? Uh, so, so the entire. Uh, so, so when you speak about you know the attacks on journalists, yes, it has to be seen in a particular context. You can't you can't remove you can't remove the context from uh, uh, you know in which uh, you, from which these attacks you know you know rather in which these attacks you know are are specifically located. Uh, so uh, so so these are the issues that 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 I wanted to flag, uh, and of course you know the. The targeting of journalists is is now is not just commonplace now. I mean, earlier earlier it was, uh, in fact, journalists had you know uh, were in fact told to be told to be responsible to uh, to to do you know, responsible reporting to uh, uh, you know. And today, in fact, in fact, the the uh, let's say the shoe is you know on the other foot you know uh, uh, in the in fact regulation. We have today people in public office calling journalists prostitutes. Okay. And uh, and all kinds of light comments being made about women, and then and then trolling, which which was already sort of referred to by the previous uh, speaker. So this so uh, so so you have offline threats. Yes, you have offline. Uh, uh, I mean, they're beaten up. Journalists go and uh, you know 
you know, go, and, uh, go to cover a student, student demonstration, uh, they are in fact molested, there is certain influence. But for the common citizen, I mean, to even enter a police station and to and to get an uh, to get an FIR registered, you know. So it's not that. So even in a democracy, you you have uh, it's it's not all that uh, all that you know hunky dory. <laughs> so 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 here you have to fight for your rights, even uh, uh, even within you know democracy, and so which is not a seemingly you know authoritarian. Uh, Kind of government that we have today, okay. Now, uh, uh, so so uh, of course you know we we have also discussed the issue of uh, the issue of the murder of Gauri Lankesh, which was again uh, there is a certain political context to it. The issue of murder of Shantanu Bhomik too has a certain political context to it because uh, because uh, because everybody knows that there was this atmosphere being being built to show that law and order had sort of broken down in that. Uh, in the state of Tripura, and uh, uh, and it didn't, uh, and and uh, and somehow it did add to the atmospherics of the entire debate. It did add to the atmospherics, whether whether one likes it or not. So here you have journalists who are used in such ways, who are uh, who are who are instrumental. Uh, I mean, I mean, I'm rather who are made instruments for certain uh, for certain sectarian as well as you know political objectives. So the context uh, I'm saying is extremely important you know, in all these cases. I mean, I mean, how does it happen? You know, why does it happen? It's not that just you know there's been a spurt in violence. Yes, yes. Uh, today there is uh, there is an all pervasive, uh, uh, atmosphere you know of violence today, which 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 gets the sanction from the highest authority sometimes. Sometimes silence, not speaking about uh, uh, serious crimes uh, uh, against women and children. Is also seen as tacit support to the you. You have you have elected representatives coming out in support of rape accused. Now I'm saying that in this, it is it is precisely this kind of an atmosphere which endangers everybody, you know, including journalists. So I mean, journalists are not an honorary exclusive beings, you know, sitting sitting on an island. They are they are very much part of society and they influence and they also get influenced by what's happening in society. So, so, so I think these are the distinctions that we have to uh, we have to make, and uh, of course, the other challenge that that I think impinges on the freedom of journalists. These are the external issues that one has mentioned. You have the internal challenges, the entire corporate control, you know, of the media today, because there is a nexus. The uh, a you have the corporate control of the media, and b you have you know, in. You you have deep you know inequality in society. I mean, how is I mean how I mean how are sort of I mean how are journalists supposed to be free in this kind of a context? How are they supposed to exercise their freedom when 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 uh, your your you know your organizations you know have such uh, deeply entrenched you know pockets with with, with the corporate uh, corporate world, isn't it? And and the entire you know precarious nature of the employment of journalists also today is also a major challenge. So, 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 amid uh, you have now, now today the government only, uh, only recently has has introduced this very interesting concept called uh, fixed term employment. Now, 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 earlier it was only for you know the apparel sector. So this is a central government which has done this, which means that you'll have three month short term employment. Now in all sectors, now, now you will have journalists organizations also doing that. They'll say we're going to keep you only for three months, and that. Uh, and that you know, for three months, we'll give you the full, full benefits, you know, for permanent employee. But employment is only for three months. Now, if you have a central government law that says that you have a law like fixed term employment for all sectors, how can you not assume that it won't be applicable to, to, uh, to also to the media? So, so in so in such circumstances, the whole idea of freedom of the media, right, uh, uh, comes under. Uh, they are sort of taking up these issues, and they are. Taking them up, you know, at you know, at various levels. So that is a ray of optimism that I see in this entire, entire scenario. So, uh, so with those words, I shall end, and I hope uh, I have made some, some, some contribution to the debate today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rajalakshmi, for that uh, excellent closing address. 
Uh, that brings us to the end of this session, but I think we can take a few questions, uh, if you have any, if you just let us know who you're addressing it to. Um, and we would need a couple of roving mics going around. Uh, any questions for any of the speakers or panelists? Sorry? No, I mean, they're here in the hall. I mean, they're not on the stage, but we can have them respond to you. Yeah? Mr. Acharya, Ajul Acharya, yes. Thank you for your question. Uh, what we do is, if you go back and look at our uh, earlier reports, what you will see is like last year report, we, we included uh, five or six conflict zones. So we basically call uh, those area which are, which are uh, volatile in, uh, in the context of freedom of expression and uh, press freedom, uh, uh, the uh, conflict zones. Where, uh, and then what we do is we do the special reports around that, uh, that, uh, that particular area. So this year, uh, we had, uh, we had uh, a, a series of meetings with the, with the lo uh, local journalists, uh, the journalist unions, the media, media houses there, uh, the uh, journalist association there, as a part of, uh, part of our effort uh, to kind of express solidarity to the journalist, uh, journalist in those conflict zones. So uh, the last year, we only had the meeting in uh, Kashmir. That's why you only see Kashmir there, there is no uh, no particular reason why Kashmir is only there. That's just because we only had this uh, this one uh, area covered uh, this year because we only had uh, activities there uh, regarding the meeting of sol expression of solidarity. But if you look go back and look at last year's uh, report, you will see that we have covered Chhattisgarh, we have covered uh, Kabul, we have covered uh, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, some part of Sri Lanka, some part of Pakistan, even. Uh, one part of Nepal uh, as an ongoing process of this. So uh, it's not because that we have a particular uh, political interest in uh, Kashmir, but rather it's we consider Kashmir as one of the, one of the volatile uh, volatile zones in uh, South Asia and kind of keep watch on uh, on that regularly. Thank you. I think your explanation is completely unsatisfactory, and I, I regret that you have tried to politicize a very important issue of press media freedom. You cannot write India plus Kashmir. And if you want to give this very long-winded explanation, you should have written it in the book and not left it to a questioner to answer. I think this is wrong. It's an incorrect practice. I think UNESCO should take it on board and should, not, and should ensure this does not happen again because this is not a correct way to make a political decision. As the previous questioner said, you have restricted yourself to the valley and you're trying to make a political statement which is completely uncalled for. I do not think that UNESCO should indulge in this. Uh, thank you very much for your comments. We'll, uh, I'll keep a note of uh, that and uh, we'll, we'll bring that to discussion among our editorial board. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, on this issue, I'd like to add, you know, there's uh, uh, there are regions in India which are bigger than countries. Kashmir is such a country. If we can use Chhattisgarh as a special region, which is a state in India, as because the atrocities on journalists were too many in a year to count, we have to focus on that. I mean, we shouldn't be so thin-skinned that someone pointing at our failings should uh, get us, you know, our skin, skin crawling, please. Chhattisgarh. 
Chhattis, Chhattisgarh is a state of India. Kashmir is a part of India. If something is happening in Chhattisgarh, we'll write about Chhattisgarh as journalists. And if something is happening in Kashmir, we'll I write think, about in Kashmir. Uh, may journalists. I just explain myself? Yes. I am not being thin skinned. I am asking for equal treatment for all Chhattisgarh areas and Kashmir and regions. Are same for I'm us. not talking of Chhattisgarh. He's talking of Chhattisgarh in the previous report. Yes. So please let so us why say uh, why shouldn't the explanation yes. have been given? I am just saying in all uh, humility that if UNESCO wants to maintain an equal status for all countries and all participants, please explain it like that. And if you have given a special coverage for some uh, troubled regions, uh, explain those also. And as our questioner said, uh, please don't just focus on one part or one state without giving the full context. So all these things say, then if you give one part of Kashmir, then you have to say the POK. So all these things, and my main point is, please do not politicize a very important issue of uh, uh, press freedom and media freedom. This is a vital issue. We all are interested in it. Every state is interested in it. But if you politicize it, you're downgrading the importance of the work you have been doing. This is my point. So that it should be explained somewhere. It should be put properly in the proper context. So that nobody can misunderstand. It's not a question of being thin-skinned at all. I think all of us know about statehood and everything. And I do not think that is... Uh, in, in, is, a, is a fair reference. But I would like to say that in all due honesty, please respect sovereignty. Please respect the work that UN is doing, the issues that UN is guarding, and explain yourself if you have chosen to make a special. Certainly saying India plus Kashmir in the list of contents displays a certain, what? well, I would India not use the word Kashmir? again, but it displays a certain attitude which is not called for. Um, Hello, I haven't even had time to look at the report, uh, but uh, I know that it is IFJ regions with special focus wherever, it, wherever there is conflict and wherever journalists are affected, and certainly journalists are seriously affected in Kashmir. I mean, there are daily curfews, there are internet bans, there are, I mean, there's every kind of problem. There are arrests, arbitrary arrests. So it is a problem area. Maybe it is, I mean, I would agree, maybe you shouldn't say India plus Kashmir, okay. There, I would agree, and that seems to be on the contents. But beyond that, the focus does need to be on conflict zones. And I think in the past, there has been a lot of focus on Bastar, for instance. This year, it seems to be Kashmir. Uh, thank you very much. Just, uh, just a small my side that uh, UNESCO is not involved in uh, the editorial decision of this report. So please uh, do not blame or blame anything uh, in the report uh, to the UNESCO. They are our partner for a long time, but uh, we don't, we don't, uh, <laughs> we don't, we don't ask, the, ask them, or even they, they won't even know until the end that uh, what what is being printed. But uh, certainly, I take uh, your point, uh, your point, and we'll keep, we'll uh, keep that discussion in our editorial board. But uh, it's not our policy, IFJ's policy, to politicize any issue. And if you read on the Kashmir. Uh, you will probably not notice that the whole chapter we have uh, very uh, uh, we have tried very hard to uh, take out any political context as far as possible from from the whole uh, whole chapter and just focus on the journalist. Thank you very much, ma'am. Do we have, okay, we can just take maybe two more questions at most, all right? Uh, one of them being you. Uh, my, question. Uh, my question is from Pankaji. Huh. Uh, it was your brilliant speech, thanks for that. It was the financial status of the journalists who are the really sufferers, and especially from the media houses. And, and uh, the, the, their freedom and this sort of the freedom, uh, uh, even eight pers persons die um, from the attacks. It's horrible. But many of them are dying uh, uh, due to the financial crunch. Kindly. Thank you. Uh, there are uh, 100,000, 110,000 uh, registered publications in India, which are only registered. Rest are not unregistered. Uh, there are about 900 news channels, uh, not channels, television channels in India. There are more than now 500 radio stations in India. 
and uh, we have been uh, uh, saying that the, uh, uh, the well-being of the journalist should be uh, uh, part of a government, a considered government policy. Now, government at time and again has come up with commissions. We had Pachavat Commission earlier. Now we have uh, uh, commission, uh, and that sets down basically the tone for the welfare of journalists. What has happened in the last 20 years in media is that it's very fast and very big and very rich. And the other part of media has stayed where it was. So we need uh, uh, Bachavat Commission to basically give a parity to the people. It's almost like uh, uh, minimum support price. So we have to have that parity for those people who have not grown. They will never say that I want the Bachavat Commission salary. Because then the free market forces kick in. And the free market forces says that if you are useful to a media house, you will be paid according to your usefulness to that media house. You will be shocked to hear that there are almost in India now uh, a bidding war like we see in uh, uh, Premier Football League for anchors. And like uh, Messi and uh, Cristiano, all these people, they change their uh, clubs. Anchors change their uh, television channels. And uh, the uh, highest bidder gets that. So that's a free market area where things are happening. Now we are talking about the area where things are bad. The uh, regional papers, the rural journalists. Yeah. 150 rupees a day, 200 rupees a day. This is the kind of um, payments they get for a day's work. And these are journalists who have motorcycles, their own cameras, they go around, get stuff. If you look at the um, uh, uh, video um, agencies, this is the kind of money they are paying to journalism where you have this uh, football league sort of a game going on. They don't need that. What we need is safety net and which comes out in different commissions uh, and we should push that the recommendations of those commissions have to be uh, carried out by organizations. That's the basic thing. And I think only there are two or three large papers which have uh, uh, implemented the latest commission. And those papers actually are not doing very well. I think it's the Hindu and uh, Tribune or uh, that, Deccan Herald. The big papers who are really making lots of money are not worried about that. So that is the collective responsibility of all of us, to keep talking about that, to keep bringing focus back on that, that this is the area of journalists who are, who need some sort of a safety net. So that's, that's the whole thing of the equal society, I mean what we are talking about, redistribution of wealth. So if your company is making 1400 crores in a year, you better pay some, you know, uh, decent amount to your stringer who's sitting in Dantewada or something and sending you pictures. That's, that's what I think and it should come, it will come only when we keep talking about it. We keep telling the owners, we keep telling the uh, senior media journalists whenever they are, that we owe a responsibility to them was well, ultimately our product be it a newspaper, be it a television channel, is equally fed and nurtured by those people who are working in the trenches. That's the only way I can think in this situation. We are not a state-run media anymore. So the state can only regulate to an extent. That's all. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm afraid we really have run out of time now. So I did say there might be one more question, but I really don't think we have time for any more questions. Uh, thank you very much to uh, you. All right, but this is a, a short question, please. Uh, yeah. I want to ask uh, for, every, for everyone. I'm sorry? Uh, I wanted to ask. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. 
uh, as uh, Modi's, uh, I'll just take an example of Modi's. This is the election year, and lo a lot of uh, news agencies are being opened up. Uh, a lot of uh, these existing broadcasters, they can uh, abundantly just give out uh, broadcasting license to uh, people that, uh, with a, a big uh, amount of money. They can just sell it out. Uh, but new uh, licenses can, can't be, uh, Broadcasting Commission doesn't give out new licenses. Existing uh, broadcasters can only give out license. They can only give out licenses. Then the, uh, I, I just want to uh, ask this, that uh, what will happen to the uh, uh, people, uh, to the journalists who are being hired just uh, for, these, uh, for the election year? Uh, how are these uh, journalists being protected? And also uh, the existing journalists, the journalists who are working now, what will happen to their news when uh, certain, uh, uh, certain news agencies, media houses are being uh, opened up? Uh, just uh, for the election year, targeted uh, news agencies are being opened up. Mm. Uh, not only in Modi's, but in Modi's it's happening now. Uh, we are journalists and uh, we are facing these problems because uh, these uh, journalists are coming out. So mm. uh, they are being paid more uh, than us. The, the, I think it, it is the uh, situation in other countries as well. I hope it is. <laughs> so what will happen to uh, countries when election year is approaching, especially the presidential election is being approaching? How can we be protected by Modi's? Does anyone who would like Modi's to respond to money. that? Uh, uh, anyone who would like to respond to that? Mr. Pachari Hojal? Uh, yes. <laughs> See, I mean, we don't know much about Maldives' uh, 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 media. But one thing I know that on Maldives, the social media is really huge. Because you do something about Maldives, it just goes on social media, it becomes viral and all that. So it means there's a country which is basically crying for a robust media, uh, this thing. And uh, about this journalists who are working and journalists who have been hired because there's an election year, see the people who are working part-time also get paid more, always in every field in the world. Because they do not have the security of a proper job. So that is basically their uh, um, reparation for not having a permanent job. So you continue your job, keep working it, let people come and go. Don't worry about it. The state media was uh, fined more than uh, the private media's. So I, I think it should be mentioned because it's the state media and the government find them. If you, if you uh, read, like, uh, it is mentioned there. It's mentioned in the report, uh, like, uh, if it is fa falls within the 12, uh, 12 months. But I remember that uh, MBC, uh, uh, the uh, state media was uh, fined as well. But we are, we are not, we are rather questioning the system of uh, the, how the fines are uh, implemented. Uh, because it's uh, just a committee of a certain government appointed who, who can fine the media, and the media cannot I appeal against that until they pay the fine. So we are questioning the whole uh, process rather than who is being uh, fined. And just a, just a point to add on Maldives media, I've been to Maldives uh, uh, once, and I have uh, uh, quite, a, quite a few friends there. The only thing I can say about Maldives is currently, at least uh, after the uh, state of emergency, this is, uh, there is a lot of self-censorship because it's a small country and there is not much, uh, not much uh, business from the media itself. So uh, no media can actually, uh, you can't expect any media there, which are basically the online medias uh, rather than printed and stuff. No, you can't expect people, uh, media to be critical of uh, government or the establishment. Thank you. Well, thank you. That brings us to the end of the session now. And uh, we will break for tea. Uh, it's 5 past 12. We request you to be back here at 12.20 exactly so that the next session can begin. That's a panel discussion on harmful speech in India. Thank you. Thank you very much.